<laughs> here we go. Here we go then. So this is all going to be about telling the poisonous mushrooms from the edible and hallucinogenic mushrooms. And as many of you, of you know, mushrooms in English speaking countries were often known as toadstools. But it turns out it had nothing to do with the kind of toad that's sitting on this Ammonita pantheroina, pantheroides, I should say. But the toad actually re was an old English term for death. And so here's uh, the, one of the very famous toadstools, Ammonita pantheroides. And it integrates with a yellow mushroom known as Ammonita gemata. And what I found out about research in research in the late 1970s is the darker the cap, the more toxic the mushroom. The really yellow ones weren't particularly toxic. The dark brown were a very, very toxic mushroom. The toxins are ibotenic acid and mousimol, and they cause uh, changes in size perception, depth perception, time perception, and a deep coma-like sleep often results. And people can get very violent and have horrible dreams in the sleep. So some people eat these mushrooms as a hallucinogen, but it is an absolutely terrible hallucinogen. And the Ammonita pantheroides is distinguished by this little roll collar vulva. I don't know if you can see the arrow uh, moving around at the base of the mushroom. So that's typical of Ammonita pantheroides and also Ammonita gemata. Now, the other mushroom, and the, probably the most famous of all mushrooms, is Ammonita muscaria. In Europe, it's Ammonita muscaria, variety muscaria, and the warts are white on top. And in North America, the warts tend to be sort of cream color. And so what we've called Ammonita muscaria in North America, in most of North America, actually is a different species known as Ammonita chrysoblema. And Ammonita chrysoblema was named in about 1918 in Michigan. And I'm, and I'm sure this is the mushroom that you have in Alberta. And it's the mushroom we have in most of North America, except in California, where we do have Ammonita muscaria variety Flavi volveda. And then in cities, we will sometimes find the white warted cap, Ammonita muscaria, associated with trees that were brought over from Europe and planted here. And muscaria differs from the Ammonita pantherina, pantheronoides, and gemata by having sort of multiple rings of tissue down here at the base of the stem. Now, Ammonita chrysoblema was named as a different species than Ammonita muscaria because it, the mushroom that was originally named was pure white. It had a white cap, white stem, didn't have any color at all. But it turns out that no, if you look at the genetics of the mushrooms in North America, everything we have, except in California and in, and in parts of Alaska, is Ammonita chrysoblema. And it doesn't matter whether it's white, red, yellow, brown, or orange, it's all Ammonita chrysoblema. So this is the North American fly agaric. And it, it's not quite as toxic as Ammonita pantheroides, but it has exactly the same toxins. And it also sometimes has a chemical known as muscarin, which causes perspiration, salivation, vomiting, diarrhea, your pupils shrink, shrink and you think you've gone blind. So this is not a good mushroom to eat. However, with Ammonita chrysoblema and Ammonita muscaria varieties, you can extract the toxins in boiling water. And as long as you throw away the water and do multiple extractions, you can eventually get rid of all the toxin and actually eat the mushroom. So the next mushroom that I want to talk about, though, is Ammonita phylloides. And this mushroom, it doesn't matter how you prepare it. You can boil the water, throw it away. You can cook it. You can eat it raw. It doesn't affect the toxin at all. And Ammonita phylloides causes up, and its close relatives cause about 95% of deaths worldwide. And Ammonita phylloides was not native to Mer North America either, 
But unlike Ammonita muscaria, when it was brought on nursery trees from Europe, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, and now it's spreading inland, it has adapted to our native trees. And so this has become a widespread mushroom in the woods, uh, not just in cities, throughout the West Coast and the East Coast. And I suspect that someday it's going to be showing up in Michigan, Mississippi. Minnesota and even making it up into Saskatchewan and into Alberta. So you want to know what Ammonita phylloides looks like. And because it is so deadly, but it's also one of the most delicious mushrooms in the world. People have reported to me uh, before dying that um, it's the best meal they ever had. Now it turns out if you get good medical treatment right away and the prime, most important thing is a uh, high volume uh, IV fluids. You can actually flush the toxins out of your body, and about 95% of the people who can eat who eat this mushroom will survive. Now, just this week, there's been two deaths from Afghan immigrants in Poland who ate this mushroom, but they weren't up. The hospitals weren't up on the proper treatment. I think the the boys uh, possibly could have been saved. But it starts out rather egg-shaped. It has a free gills, a white spore print, a ring on the stem. And in this case, the vulva at the base is a sac-like cup, which is very different from the vulva on Ammonita panthronoides and Ammonita muscaria. So now I'll give you a little quiz. One of these two mushrooms is edible and a fairly popular good edible known as cochera. I don't think it's an exceptional edible. The other one is Ammonita phylloides, uh, which is deadly poisonous. Look close, which is which? The one on the left or the one on the right? I'm not going to eat either one, by the way. Notice how the mushroom starts out looking very much like a puffball, a nice round egg. But if you cut it open from top to bottom, you'll see a developing cap, gills, and stem inside. And this is the Ammonita clyptoderma, the edible one. And you can see this flaring cup-like vulva. Here's your cup-like vulva showing very well on the Ammonita phylloides. <coughs> now, both of these mushrooms sometimes can have a whitish cap, can sometimes have a greenish cap, and can sometimes have a brownish cap. And this is why uh, I don't eat any Ammonita, although there are people who eat Ammonita cochra, but every once in a while somebody makes a mistake and it's very serious. Now there are other mushrooms that contain the same toxin, alpha amanitin, and I'm really glad that uh, whoever picked that Lepiota out of the armillarias for your meal today found the Lepiota because a lot of Lepiotas are, are toxic and a number of them contain alpha amanitin. This particular one, Lepiota subincarnata, has result, resulted in deaths in New York and British Columbia and down in Arizona. It's widespread. Uh, this particular photograph was taken in my own garden. So exactly the same toxins. And if you ate a meal of these mushrooms, now these aren't real big. They're about two inches in diameter. Uh, but if you ate all the ones in the picture, Unless you got to the hospital promptly and had a doctor who knew how to treat you properly, your chances of survival are really very, very slim. So I don't eat any Lepiotas. Now, another mushroom that contains uh, alpha manitin is a little brown crud mushroom, Conosophy phalaris, also Conosophy rugosa. There's talk about moving both of these to a different genus, Foliotina. They have a ring on the stem. They have a rusty brown spore print that's distinctive. But most often, people who eat these think they are picking a psilocybe, a mind-altering hallucinogenic mushroom. And they look very much like a psilocybe, except that the spore print on psilocybe is purple brown, and the spore print on the canosabe and foliotinas is rusty brown. And so it's very important to spore print your mushrooms until you become quite familiar with them. Often the spore print is free. Here's your free spore print on the top of the ring of this uh, Canosophy phalaris. Another mushroom that 
that people eat. And sometimes a mistake for the armillarias that you guys ate today is Gallerina autumnalis or Gallerina marginata. Both of these contain alpha omanitan. And this mushroom, if you eat enough for a decent meal, unless you get good medical treatment promptly, uh, will result in death in about 90% of the cases. But with good medical treatment and prompt treatment, getting to the doctor right away, I mean, within 24 hours, ideally, there's about a 95% survival rate. So alpha man, and remember, it doesn't matter how you prepare the mushroom, you can't destroy the toxin. It's always going to be there. So it's very important to know the mushrooms that contain alpha manitin. And this is the bunch that does, and that completes the alpha manitin section. Now, just to give you an idea, Gallerina marginata on the left, Psilocybe pelliculosa on the right. Notice how similar the two mushrooms are, are. And so if you haven't taken the spore print to detect the purple brown spore print of the mushroom on the right, you're gonna make a mistake because these mushrooms were growing side by side, even touching each other in the, in the same bed just outside my office at Evergreen State College. So, and Evergreen was a very popular place to be picking hallucinogenic mushrooms. That's where Paul Stamets, Jeremy Bigwood, Jonathan Ott all came to study mushrooms with me in 1975. Now, Psilocybe cubensis is widely grown and cultivated as a hallucinogenic mushroom. It contains psilocybin and psilocin. It's typically about 0.5% psilocybin and psilocin, but some strains can be 1.2%. This is by dry weight. And some strains can be 0.1%. Now, normally this mushroom doesn't grow out in the wild, except down in Texas and Florida. And, but this photograph was taken in, in a friend's rhododendron garden in, Ro in Olympia, and I couldn't figure out why he had Psilocybe cubensis growing in his rhododendron garden, but he was he was uh, mulching his rhododendrons with horse manure and shavings, and it was from racehorses that had recently been brought up from Florida, and they had viable spores. But this is the most commonly cultivated of the hallucinogenic mushrooms widespread throughout North America. Now. I consider psilocybin and psilocin to be the most, one of the most important medicinal drugs, one of the important way, ways of getting people off of opioids and heroin, to deal with people dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, to get people uh, who have an alcohol problem, who have a spousal abuse problem. So proper treatment and uh, under careful supervision, these mushrooms have a powerful ability to change your your mind and change your personality totally and they make people far more empathetic towards each other i had been researching hallucinogenic mushrooms for 10 years before i tried them and i'm pretty impervious to psilocybin and psilocin it turned out and i took a massive dose before it had any effect and at first i thought and for 10 years i thought it was the worst thing biggest mistake I'd ever made, but I came to realize later that it had made me a far more caring person and the effect has been permanent. And these things are not addictive. In fact, if you try and abuse them, they quit working. So I'm very, very interested in the use of psilocybin in a medicinal setting, uh, not as a recreational drug. It presents some real danger as a recreational drug, but carefully and properly used, it's a powerful way to deal with end-of-life anxiety. If you have cancer, it's a powerful way. You get about a 70% recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder in soldiers who've returned from the war or people who've been traumatized uh, by witnessing a horrible accident. And here's some more of the psilocybe. Psilocybe cyanescens grows on wood chips, and people are starting to spread it around. It's you find it on the West Coast. I think it originated in riverbanks uh, among driftwood, but it's a wood rotter, where Psilocybe cubensis is a manure rotter. It grows on things like buffalo dung and elephant dung and uh, cow dung. 
it's, it's widespread in semi-tropical areas where this Psilocybe cyanescens is a more northerly mushroom found on both the east coast and the west coast, but people are spreading it around and growing it on wood chips. And Psilocybe semilanceata is another hallucinogenic mushroom. It's called the Liberty Cap, little tiny mushroom, uh, but a, but 15 of these will will send most people on a trip. I took 90 and 90 had no effect on me, although Gary Linkoff was completely out of his gourd on 15. So it's people can be very variable in how they react to these hallucinogenic mushrooms. But there are also mushrooms in the Genopolis group that contain psilocybin and psilocin. And in both the United States and Canada, it's currently illegal to possess a mushroom that contains these mushroom, these chemicals, whether you know it or not. Now, Gymnopolis ventricosis and Gymnopolis voitkii are related to an East Coast mushroom, generally known as Gymnopolis spectabilis, Gymnopolis genonius, that is a very, very bitter mushroom, but it contains psilocybin and psilocin, and it's called Big Laughing Jim and it can reach dinner plate size and diameter. Gymnopolis luteofolius is more the size of those armillarias that you were eating today. But uh, these are both hallucinogenic mushrooms, but they're very, very bitter. It would be very, very unpleasant to eat, but they are wood rotters. Now, I mentioned earlier, when you find a, what looks like a puffball, always cut it open from top to bottom, right through the middle and look inside. Was this a puffball? Not with that, those developing gills and stem. A puffball is going to look uniform, pure white, like a marshmallow. This is a baby uh, a destroying angel, uh, an all white ammonite that's typical of uh, the East Coast and the Midwest of the United States. So this is one not to eat. And here's an interesting case where the mushroom on the bottom I found for sale in a farmer's market as a puffball. So I purchased it, cut it open, and you can see that little hint of, of yellow just under the cap, and you can see the developing gills. This is what we called at the time a baby Ammonita muscaria. I now know since this photograph was taken in Olympia that it was an Ammonita chrysoblema. And here's your puffball on top. Notice how uniform, sort of marshmallow-like, the, the interior isn't sticky like a marshmallow, but it has the same softness of a marshmallow. Now, Gastroprolyla fumosa happens to be a stinking puffball that you don't want to eat. But some other puffballs, or all the others that don't uh, smell bad, are good eating mushrooms. So the puffballs are great to eat. Just don't make a mistake of mixing in Ammonita muscaria. Ammonite chrysoblema. So here's a good edible puffball. This is one when you see it, you should eat it, but only as long as it's uniform, pure wood, white inside. As soon as it starts to change color and get a little bit greenish and eventually uh, some species turn purple, some black, some brown inside and are a powdery spore mass, they're no longer good to eat. In fact, they can make you quite sick. And ingesting the spores on a mature puffball is really hard on your lungs and, and can cause some severe problems with dogs who bite into a mature puffball and ingest a whole bunch of spores. This is Calbovista subsculpta. It can reach the size of a basketball or a, or a soccer ball. And it's a very tasty edible. I like to slice it about the slice, the thickness of a piece of bread that you were going to eat for a sandwich, dip it in a, uh, in a batter that I would use to make French toast, and then indeed fry it for breakfast and serve it with maple syrup. Uh, so this is a mushroom you don't want to pass up, you want to eat, just make sure it's uniform, pure white like this. Once it looks like this, where the scales are starting to break and color out, I know if I cut that open, it would be kind of greenish and turning slimy. If it was even older, it would be a powdery, awful mess. Now, there are things, however, that look like a puffball that aren't. Now, sclerodermas start out pure white inside, but they're not soft like a marshmallow. They're very, very firm. And they soon turn a dark purple or a blackish color. 
eating just half of a scleroderma sepa, and that's what this is, you're, you'll have just a few moments be, before you're heading for the bathroom and you won't make it. Uh, you will be making a mess on the floor and it will be coming out uh, as vomit and uh, other and excrement both. So these earth balls are sometimes mistaken because they start out underground. The people think that, oh, I found a truffle. These aren't a truffle. Other people pick them thinking they found a puffball. But remember, puffballs are soft like a marshmallow. They're not firm like an earth ball. And there's a lot of different species of sclerodermas, and you don't want to eat any of them. Some of them are toxic enough that they'll kill dogs. They can kill pigs. So sclerodermas, you want to know those and stay away from them. Now, these are truffles. Are all truffles good to eat? No. The truffles that are good to eat all have a very, very delightful aroma. And they smell great. If they smell great, they taste great. If you were to eat a young Imaia gigantea, and these are found uh, on the East Coast down in the Blue Mountains in the Blue Ridge area, uh, and, it's, and it didn't smell like anything, it wouldn't taste like anything. But it's a very, very delicious mushroom once it's mature and then has a delightful odor and a delightful taste. The same is true of Tuber lyonii, the pecan truffle. And it often is a rumpant. Uh, these appears at the surface of the ground. And so when people are raking up ripe pecans in the fall, they often ripe, uh, rake up ripe Tuber lyonii. And if it's fragrant, it's very good to eat. But if you want something that's really, really delicious to eat, try an Oregon white truffle. I got to go uh, truffle hunting once with uh, truffle dogs down in Eugene, Oregon. There were eight of us. We paid $1,200 for the uh, guided tour, which included a very fancy lunch. That was 800, not 800 a piece. It was 800, uh, 1,200 for the eight of us. So, and, uh, the, but, the uh, dogs only exposed the mature truffles. The immature truffles didn't have a smell, and so the dogs didn't touch them. And it was very interesting watching truffle dogs hunt truffles. They would expose the truffle, and you had to have to watch the dog closely. And a well-trained dog, as soon as the truffle is exposed, it would leave the truffle behind and head off looking for the next one. And then you would just pluck the truffle from the, from the uh, ground, put it in your bag. We wound up with one pound of tuber jibosum for our day's work. That would be two ounces each for us uh, to take home and uh, do something with. But you don't just sit down and eat the truffles. I first took my, my two ounces of truffles, took half of them and put them in and wrapped them in a, in a dry paper towel, put them in a one gallon jar and filled the jar with whole eggs, uncooked whole raw eggs, whole uncooked raw avocados, hard cheeses, butter. And so I had two gallon jars full of these truffle uh, these foods, and then I put it in the refrigerator for two days. And after two days, I took the truffles out, changed the paper, took the, all the food out, and I had this these deliciously truffled uh, avocados. You just slice the avocado open and eat it all by itself. I had truffled butter, truffled cheese. And I did this a total of three times before the truffle aroma was starting to fade a bit. And then I started to shave the truffles onto the meal. So I would cook a batch of pasta, uh, add some of the truffled cheese. Asiago cheese was one of the best. The firm cheeses, the hard cheeses took up the truffle aroma the best. And, you know, so I shaved some truffle cheese onto the uh, uh, pasta and then shaved some tuber jibosum uh, uh, onto that and make just this incredible meal. I literally ate on that two ounces of truffles for two years because I froze the butter and I'd, I'd, and I'd scrambled eggs in the, in the morning, and scrambled truffled eggs, and I would and then eat them with a truffle buttered toast. Now, the last thing down there, the Lafomyces americana, 
never has a good flavor, never is good to eat. So it's really important to realize that only some truffles are great eating. By the way, Tuber Jabosum sells for about $800 a pound. So we got a real bargain on our guided trip. Now, Matsutake. Now, on the West Coast, our Matsutake is Tricholoma morillianum. We long thought it was Tricholoma magnivillari. And mag Tricholoma magnivillari is in Canada. It is in the United States. But it's a more Eastern species. They look alike. They taste alike. You can't tell them apart. But on the West Coast, we have Ammonita smithiana, which sometimes people mistake for a Matsutake. And on the East Coast, there's other mushrooms in the same subgenus as Ammonita smithiana and that are also very toxic. Now, the thing about Ammonita smithiana is if you ate one, after a, a couple of days, your kidneys will start to shut down and you're going to wind up in the hospital for months, literally, on kidney dialysis. Your kidneys will recover. You will not die, but it'll be a very, very expensive experience. So how do you tell a Smithiana from a Matsutake? Well, first of all, the, and they both end in a point at the very bottom of the stem, but the Matsutakes taper smoothly from the gills down to the end of the stem where the Ammonite Smithiana has a big bulb. And so that's one thing you look for. Also, if you lay the Ammonitis smithiana stem in the palm of your hand and squeeze down with your thumb, you can squeeze hard, nothing will happen. But if you really put your muscle to it, the Ammonitis smithiana will just explode. A Matsutake will not explode. You can apply all the pressure you can possibly uh, apply pressing down with your thumb on the stem, and it's hard as a rock. It just will not will not blow up unless it's wormy and if it's wormy you don't want to eat it anyway so a good matsutake will not explode when pressured and the other interesting thing about it is if you cut the stem with a knife the matsutake will squeak the ammonita will not so this is how to safely pick and eat the Matsutakis and leave the Ammonitas behind and not make a very, very serious error and because it's awfully uh, uncomfortable when you can't pee anymore and you've got to be on dialysis for a few months. And catathalasma species are edible and they're hard like a Matsutake. They don't have nearly as good a flavor as a Matsutake but they also can easily be mistaken for the Ammonita smithiana. And again, the catathalasma species will squeak and they're hard. The um, Ammonita smithiana and its lookalikes on the East Coast and the Midwest will not when cut with a knife. So should you have eaten that? Yeah, you can eat the bottom ones. They're not great. Don't eat the top ones. I can't believe how many times people eat Ammonita pantheroinoides, thinking they've got an Agaricus augustus. I mean, there are people that intentionally eat pantheroinoides uh, for the high, although most people will only do that once. It's a very miserable high. But let's look at the few subtle differences between pantheroinoides and augustus. First of all, there's a slight difference in gill color between white and chocolate brown. And Agaricus augustus. Uh, rarely is as big as this one my son uh, uh, Christopher is holding. Now, Christopher is now uh, approaching 50 years old, so this is a very old photograph. But Agaricus Augustus has a beautiful smell of almonds. It bruises yellow. Uh, Ammonite pantheroinoides doesn't have a, a decent smell. It doesn't bruise. And when I'm identifying a mushroom for the table, I'm using all of my senses. I feel the mushroom and crush it with my hand to feel the texture. I smell it. I, put it. I can put any mushroom in my mouth, including deadly ones, and chew on it. And then I spit them out, and I want to see what they taste like. Now, remember, the deadliest ammonitis tastes delicious. It's not a good test for whether you can eat a mushroom or not, but often it will help you with the identification. Ammonita pantheroides is delicious. It has a wonderful flavor. So does the Ammonitis muscaria and its lookalikes, but you don't want to eat them.
And the other thing about the uh, agaricus species, as well as chlorophyllum, lepiota, and pluteus species, but not ammonitis, they all have free gills, but, the, but these agaricus, chlorophyllums, lepiotas, and pluteus species, you can break the stem off in a ball and socket fashion and separate it from the cap. That will not happen with an ammonita. So even if you're dealing with a white spored chlorophyllum or a white spored lepiota, you can tell it's not an ammonita by this ball and socket breaking. And pluteus is a pink spored mushroom, but it also breaks in a ball and socket fashion. Now pluteus is very soft flesh, ammonita is very soft flesh. They're very similar feel to them, but a very different way and they break in the ball and socket fashion. So here's chlorophyllum racotes, which is an incredibly delicious edible mushroom. Its diameter can reach the size of a lunch plate, sometimes up to a dinner plate, but, uh, and it has a white spore print and white gills. And so here I can understand how somebody might mistake it for Ammonita pantheranoides, and they often do. But the difference is that ball and socket break. The chlorophyllum racotes will break like a ball and socket. The Ammonita pantheranoides will not. Now, if you want to eat chlorophyllum racotes, however, you've got a little bit of an additional problem. There's chlorophyllum molybdides. It also breaks in a ball and socket, but it has a green spore print. Now, the gills start out white. In fact, the spores themselves are white until they're fully mature. They only turn green late in age. Chlorophyllum molybdides is extremely poisonous. It causes not death, but it'll cause bloody vomiting, bloody diarrhea, and extremely uh, extreme sickness, especially if eaten raw. Don't eat any mushrooms raw. The only exception that I would make is a prime truffle. You're only eating tiny amounts. You're after that more for flavor. And you also, the other thing that chlorophyllum rhicotes can be mistaken for is something like Ammonita alpinicola, which is in the muscaria complex. And uh, again, you've got a white, they both have white gills, but the Ammonita alpinicola will not break in a ball and socket fashion. So here's chlorophyllum molybdides next to chlorophyllum brunium. And chlorophyllum brunium will bruise orange and then brown. And there's a white spore print. Chlorophyllum molybdides does not, it bruises brown directly and has a green spore print. But I can't believe how often people eat chlorophyllum molybdides thinking they've got Coprinus comatus, the shaggy maid. They both have shaggy caps, but there is a very, very subtle difference in the shape of the cap. One is flat like a plate, the other is more shaped more like a bullet. And uh, the coprinus comatus, as it matures, the spores are black, and it develops into black ink. And yet people make this mistake of not eating the coprinus comatus, which uh, I think tastes a little like oysters, which I'm allergic to, and so I don't eat it. But I remember one day driving down the Icefields Parkway, and from Jasper until I uh, reached uh, uh, the summit, uh, and was about to enter uh, uh, the next park south, the road on both sides was solid Coprinus comatus. And it, those of you who've driven the Icefields Parkway uh, know that it's cleared on both sides for about 100 yards. And there must have been millions and millions of Coprinus comatus growing. Now, the trick in eating it, though, is you want to eat it while it's still light pink and before it started to turn black. And it dissolves from the bottom up. And so the trick is when you pick these things to eat, and you find some nice prime ones like these ones over here on the left, not like these over on the right. Put them upside down in your basket. Keep them as cool as possible. You can also store them longer if you put them underwater once you get home and refrigerate them because the decomposition product <coughs> requires oxygen to happen. And um, the, the ink from Coprinus comatus, interestingly, was used during World War II as a secret ink because the black ink looks absolutely normal when you write with it, 
but somebody with a microscope could look at it and see the spores and know that it was the proper message and not uh, something else. So shaggy mane is a, is a really interesting, important edible. Pay attention to the shape. Pay attention to the gill color and the spore color. But all the time, people are making the mistake of eating chlorophyll and lepidites, thinking they've got coprinus comatus. Uh, I, it boggles my mind that people would make a mistake that significant, but they do. Coprinopsis atramentarius, atramentaria, which was formerly coprinus atramentarius, is known as tippler's bane because you can eat as much of this mushroom as you want up until the moment that you drink alcohol. But if you eat any of this mushroom after you've drank, after you've had some alcohol, and sometimes for as long as a week, 10 days after you've had alcohol, this mushroom will cause a heart palpitations and a flushed feeling, a similar, very similar to the drug ad abuse, which they give alcoholics to keep people off of the bottle. So the, and the, 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 chemical that causes the uh, reaction, the ad abuse like reaction is called coprin. And when that was tested in male beagles, they didn't test it in females, by the way, it caused significant testicular damage. And so there's no way in heck that I'm going to eat coprinopsis atramentaria, even if I wasn't going to be drinking alcohol, but I try and have a glass of wine with every meal. Now I talked about the importance of having a spore print. Now, here's the spore print of Coprinopsis atramentaria. You can see the black spores uh, underneath the overhanging cap of the upper mushroom. And often in the field, I can find my spore print on the vegetation under the mushroom. If there's overlapping caps, I find the spore print on the lower cap. So you, you don't always have to go home and take the spore print. And you take a spore print by cutting the stem off putting it flat on a piece of white paper, and it's important to use white paper. Even white spores will show up on white paper. And if you're not certain, rub your hand across the paper. A white spore will come off in your hand and, and color your hand white. If, if the mushroom has just stained the paper and you think it's a white spore, but it hasn't actually dropped any spores, nothing will come off when you rub that paper. Now, Another thing that people often make a mistake with is Ampelotus illudens, the jack-o'-lantern. Now, I've only found the eastern jack-o'-lantern once. Out west, we have Ampelotus uh, olivacens, which is more olive-colored. But both species glow in the dark. And so I took these into my room, waited at night until it, uh, it was fully dark outside, and I found they gave off enough blue-green light that I could actually read by them. And people mistake it for a chanterelle. And here's some chanterelles on the bottom, like Cantharellus roseocanus, which is abundant under spruce in the Rockies, and so you should have it up in Alberta. And the Cantharellus formosus group, I use the word group because it turns out there's four species that we've been calling Cantharellus formosus. They all look alike. They have to be separated by DNA. But notice we've got blunt ridges under these two choice edible mushrooms on the bottom where we have sharp blade-like gills under the omphalotus. And the omphalotus also tends to be huge. They can be dinner plate size. Now, there is a chanterelle in California that reaches dinner plate size, but most chanterelles, you know, it, it's going to take a dozen, half a dozen chanterelles to make a nice meal. Although I once found some um, Cantharellus cascadensis in my woods, and one mushroom was big enough that my, it took my wife and I two days to eat the one chanterelle. So learn to recognize chanterelle with the blunt forking ridges. Stay away from things like omphalotus with uh, the forking sharp blade-like gills. Now, what happens if you eat amphalotus illudens? it's very much like having a very severe case of the flu, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, general nausea. You're gonna be sick for about a week. So learn this difference. Eat the chanterelles, don't eat the omphalotus. Now this mushroom is definitely gonna be present in Alberta if you go hunting in uh, sphagnum areas. 
Cortinarius rubellus. If there's a lookalike that is associated with oaks that's found so far only in um, Michigan, but it could also be in any, I don't know if there's any oak areas in, in Alberta. I've done some mushrooming there, but I've never seen oak areas. But you, it's really important to know Cortinarius rubellus. The toxin is a relanine, and it took years and years to realize that this is a poisonous mushroom because it can take a week or 10 days before you realize you've been poisoned. And people have long forgotten that they ate this uh, incredible uh, Cortinarius. And I think it was the most recent poisoning was this year in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, somebody had been was out picking mushrooms, went to a bogging air, boggy area uh, where there was sphagnum and picked Cortinarius rubellus. Believe it or not, uh, the horse whisperer and the descendant of the founder of Ireland uh, picked a bunch of these mushrooms together and they thought they'd pick seps. Now, sep is a porcini. It's a king bolete. It has sponge on the underside. Most often, however, Cortinarius rubellus is mistaken for a chanterelle. But again, we've got those blade-like gills rather than the forking blunt ridges, so you shouldn't make that mistake. Now, the person in Canada who ate this mushroom this year, he did survive, but uh, is probably going to need uh, dialysis for his entire life and may eventually need a, a kidney transplant because this damage, unlike the Ammonitis smithiana damage, does not go away. You do not recover from poisoning by this mushroom from relanine. So it's a very, very important mushroom to know. And then I'm quite certain it is in Alberta. Now here's the armillarias we've been talking about. Desarmillaria tabescens was once known as armillaria tabescens, the one without a ring on the stem. All the other armillarias have a ring on the stem. Armillaria melia itself does not have little warts on the cap, little scales. See these little fine blackish scales on this armillaria gallica. Whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit the wrong button. And these little black, same little blackish scales on Armillaria solidipes. This is probably either this or Synapica would be the Armillaria that uh, you probably ate today. Uh, it should be in your habitat. Now, most of the time, Armillarias are pretty good to eat. But I have an unusually large number of poisonings reported from Armillaria. You, if you're going to eat it, don't eat the stems. The stems are tough. Only eat the caps cook it very thoroughly. Some people suffer hallucinations after eating it, and a fair number of people uh, have mild flu-like symptoms after eating it. So I have quit eating armillarias totally. Um, just as a, an aside, I'm sure you all are fine who ate them today, but be careful with them. Now here's a really incredibly delicious edible mushroom. And it is a, a very important mushroom because it contains lentinin. And lentinin is shown great promise in cancer treatment in uh, Japan. It hasn't been used much in the United States. And uh, the stems are tough. I, you tend to cut off the stems and throw them away. But you could put the stems in a pressure cooker and use them to flavor food. I love Lenten Eula Edotis shiitake. Uh, I, I don't eat the imported shiitake. I try and find shiitake grown in North America because I don't trust some of the cultivation techniques in parts of Asia. But don't ever eat this mushroom raw or only lightly cooked because in about 4% of the um, people who consume this mushroom raw or lightly cooked, they will suffer what's called uh, a shiitake flagellate dermatitis. And this is the photograph the, the woman sent me of her back after uh, going to a, a, a fancy high-end store where they were serving lightly cooked shiitake. She suffered this dermatitis for about two weeks. She felt like she'd been whipped with a cat of nine tails. It was extremely painful, extremely itchy and very long lasting. They eventually got it under control with cortisone. Cook all mushrooms thoroughly, especially shiitakes. 
Another uh, interesting mushroom with an interesting toxin is the Paxillus involutus group. This is a mushroom, tastes kind of sour. You can eat it once or twice, but if, if a year later you eat it again, you can wind up with uh, a hemolytic uh, uh, anemia and some people even die from it. Now, Paxillus is closely related to, to bolates. And if you know, familiar with bolates, if you rub the sponge on a bolete, the sponge rubs right off. If you rub the gills of a Paxillus, the gills rub right off. So this is a, a bolete relative and actually is genetically closely related to bolites. We're not sure how many different species we have. We have several different species in North America, but this is a mushroom I definitely would not eat, even though it's technically edible. And, and people will argue with you, oh, I've eaten this two or three times this year and it was just fine. Well, it's next year that I'm worried about, not this year. Another uh, edible mushroom, a very, very popular mushroom in, it, in Asia, what they're growing is auricularia auricula. In North America, what we have is auricularia americana. I have seen it uh, up in, uh, in Jasper, so you probably, it's widespread in North America. It's one of the jelly mushrooms, but it's a very, very firm jelly mushroom. It has sort of an ear-like shape. And so it's sometimes called a, a tree ear or a wood ear and some other uh, names that I won't repeat because they're uh, rather racist. And um, it has a very firm texture that uh, is very popular in Asian cooking. It doesn't have a lot of flavor, but what can happen is with a lot of people, you'll, after eating a meal with this, you can have excessive bleeding. So if you're on blood thinners, don't eat it. If you're on your menstrual cycle, don't eat it. And you can also suffer easy bruising if you're not on your menstrual cycle and or not taking blood thinners. So this is a mushroom that's edible, popular, but use it with care. Always make sure it's well cooked. But in this case, the cooking doesn't destroy the ability to cause the uh, bruising reaction. Now, anosobes, almost all are loaded with muscarin. There's actually four or five species that have psilocybin and don't have muscarin. And notice one of the, the bluing at the base of the stem of this anosobe hirsuta var maximum. One of the ways you identify uh, in a psilocybe, a mushroom that contains psilocybin and psilocin is by a blue staining reaction from the decomposition of the psilocin. Psilocybin does not cause the blue staining reaction. But in Anasabi hirsutivar maxima, that's not a staining reaction. That's a natural blue color. And so you don't want to be eating that mushroom or Anasabi napapes. And the, because these mushrooms are loaded with muscarin. And this is the, I mentioned muscarin earlier, perspiration, salivation, lacrimation. Your pupils shrink till you think you've gone blind and uh, vomiting, diarrhea, it'll last about a week. In, in dogs, it can sometimes result in deaths. In humans, it can come, I don't know of any actual deaths, but it can come very, very close. The poisoning can be very, very serious. The same toxins are in Clytosabe d'Albeda. Now, the interesting thing about Clytosabe d'Albeda, it grows in fairy rings in lawns, and it's often mistaken for the fairy ring mushroom. And both the DL beta and the fairy ring mushroom have a white spore print. But the, the true fairy ring mushroom, Merasmius oreades, the one that people want to eat, is, has widely spaced gills and they're not decurrent. They don't run down the stem. The Clytosabe DL beta gills are decurrent and the gills run down the stem. If you ate the four mushrooms in in this photograph, you would be in very, very bad shape rather quickly. And another mushroom that's a popular edible, uh, especially in Europe, it only kills a few dozen people a year, uh, is gyrometer esculenta. It contains a toxin known as gyrometer. Now, gyrometer is a sugar uh, linked to a monomethyl hydrazine. When it's heated, the monomethyl hydrazine is released and uh, 
so cooks sometimes die just from eating this mushroom. The aroma of the mushroom when you cook it is very, very delightful. Uh, but this mushroom can cause severe liver damage and uh, monomethylhydrazine has been shown to be exceptionally carcinogenic. So this is a mushroom that a lot of people eat. They call it calves brains, among other things. Don't eat it, even well cooked. And if you do insist on eating it, cook it thoroughly outside. Do not enjoy the vapors. The vapors themselves can kill you. Now, Gyrometer ambigua and gyrometer infula both uh, contain this same toxin the, um, that breaks down to monomethylhydrazine. And I found nice, great, big uh, specimens of gyrometer infula in the fall and little tiny specimens shown up here in the upper left of gyrometer infula in the spring. This is not an edible mushroom. Don't eat it even cooked. And Cudonia circinans has the same toxin. So this is another uh, monomethylhydrazine containing mushroom. And it, it could potentially be cause serious poisoning and or uh, help lead towards cancer. So not a mushroom to eat. Now, Gyrometra montana, however, is in a different subgenus. Of Montana, it's in the sub in the Decinaceae subgenus, the same subgenus as pig's ears mushroom Decina perlata. This does not contain gyrometrin, does not break down to monomethylhydrazine, and so is edible. However, usually there's a lot of dirt up in the center. So how do I distinguish this from Gyrometra esculenta? The Gyrometra esculenta stem. Is, is round to flattened and hollow, but not very big around. The diameter is much less than the diameter of the cap. Gyrometer Montana has this convoluted stipe that's about as wide as the stipe. It often uh, fruits on the edge of melting snow banks. Some people like to eat it. It is safe to eat. I'm not particularly fond of it. Cleaning of it, it is a pain. And so I don't mess with it, but this is one you could eat if you wanted to, and it's long been considered poisonous. Other gyrometers that you can eat that are also in the closely related to gyrometer ancillus, which is shown down here in the lower right hand corner. Pig's ears is edible, not incredible, but gyrometer caroliniana, the red, is known as the red morel, is safe to eat. Corfei is safe to eat, and so is Gyrometer uh, brunia, and, which is also known as Gyrometer fasciata, because they're all in a different subgenus from Gyrometer esculenta. They don't have the same toxins, but they are all, all four of these mushrooms are very poisonous raw. They must be thoroughly cooked before eaten. You'll get sick with any of them if eaten uh, without thorough cooking. And the same is true of morels. You have Marcello americana, definitely have it up in Alberta. And this is one of the what's called yellow morels or esculenta clade morels. We don't have esculenta itself in, Ameri in North America. We have a half a dozen species of americana. The pits can be black. Uh, the pits can be white. The pits can be uh, colored much like this. But the ridges stay pale at all times. The ridges never go black. And if you try and follow the ridges from the base of the stem up to the top, notice that the ridges sort of skip all over. They don't make a smooth pattern. Where the esculenta clade morels, you can follow the ridges all the way from the top to the bottom. So uh, Morcella importuna, the landscape morel, has been spread worldwide uh, by human activity uh, and thoroughly cooked. It's edible. It's one of my least favorite morels. Morcella angusticeps is the East Coast uh, morel with the most common black morel on the East Coast because the ridges can start out light colored, but they turn black in age. And a mushroom that you've probably never heard about, but I'm confident is in Alberta. It's common in Montana. It's one of the most common morels worldwide, but its name had been lost. And this is a morel that I actually named working with Andres Wojtek from Newfoundland. He and I both found the mushroom the same month, sent it into the same DNA expert. 
And he said, we had the same mushroom and we named it Morcella Eohespera, Eos for the God of the East, Hesperus for the God of the sunset, uh, Eos, God of the sunrise, because it was found both in Eastern North America and Western North America. All the other uh, morels, black morels, except for Importuna, are either found on the East Coast or the West Coast. But here's this widespread morel, and it turns out it's also very abundant in the Alps, in Scandinavia countries, and it had been named uh, Morcella norvegiensis uh, rather carelessly, and that name had gotten lost, but the name has been re resurrected, so I have lost my name, but it also in occurs in China. So I love the name Eo Hespera, the widespread morel, one of the most abundant morels in the world, and I'm sure many of you who eat morels have eaten it quite unknowingly. All morels are edible when thoroughly cooked. Doesn't matter whether it's a black morel, a blonde morel, a burned morel, whatever, just cook them thoroughly. They're edible. Some are tastier than others. Morcella eohespera is one of the tastiest of all. Importuna is one of the least tasty. I don't know Angustuceps, I've not eaten it. But here is what you can find in a burn in Alberta. Uh, this was one day's picking, actually about an hour and a half picking by some friends of mine who live near Jasper and who sent me, kindly sent me this photograph. Now they had forded a, uh, a shallow river to get into an area where nobody else was picking and they just hit this bonanza. There's probably at least three or four different species of morel in the picture. Doesn't matter, just cook them all up. Edible, delicious, but cook them thoroughly. Dry them, they dry beautifully and you can save them for future use. <clears throat> and Verpa bohemica has a reputation for being a poisonous mushroom. It's no more poisonous than morel. <clears throat> And actually some years, I get more poisoning reports from morels than anything else. So Verpa bohemica is poisonous when not thoroughly cooked. And that's true of all the ascomyces. And even when thoroughly cooked, you can sometimes lose muscular coordination an hour or two after the meal. So if you decide you wanna eat Verpa bohemica, eat it at home when you're not planning to go on a drive. So how do you distinguish this quote unquote early morel from a true morel? The stem goes all the way up to the cap and the cap hangs like a skirt. The bottom of the cap is not attached to the stem. In a morel, even the half free morel where the stem goes way up almost to the cap, the edge of the cap is always attached to the stem. So true morels, cap attached to the stem, false morels like Verpa bohemica, cap not attached. It's edible when cooked, but some people are sensitive to it. And thus it has a recommendation as a poisonous mushroom. But even true morels, some people eat them for 10 or 20 years without problems and they develop, they start to get a reaction to it. If they keep eating them, the reaction gets worse and worse and worse and can even be life-threatening. So if you eat a morel and you have a bad reaction to it and you decide to try it a second time and have a bad reaction again, do not try it a third time. And this is very important. And notice the variation in color uh, on these uh, varipas. That's not unusual for um, a number of ascomycetes and other mushrooms. And Sarcosfera coronaria is an edible mushroom uh, years ago, Orson Miller told me, well, he thought it tasted so, something like a pencil eraser. Uh, so I've never actually tried it. It's a popular edible in, uh, in Europe, especially in Switzerland. But the interesting thing about Sarcosfera coronaria is it is a hyper accumulator of arsenic. So if it's grown on ground that is highly contaminated in arsenic or has high normal mineral levels of arsenic, you can get poisoned by Sarcosfera coronaria. 
And so the other thing to watch out for in all mushrooms is you want to pick them in clean environments. You don't want to be picking your mushrooms in golf courses where they're spraying with herbicides because the mushroom might have concentrated the herbicide. You don't want to pick them along the roadsides where they might have still be picking up lead from the days when gasoline was leaded, but also can be picking up other toxic chemicals uh, from along the roadside. And you don't want to pick, pick them in mine areas. Now, morels, interestingly, hyperaccumulate gold. They will accumulate lead and, and they can be poisonous and they'll accumulate arsenic, uh, but they don't hyperaccumulate it. In other words, you can get, if you pick morels in old apple orchards where arsenic was used as a spray, then you can get poisoned by the morels, but there'll always be less uh, arsenic in the mushroom than there was in the soil. But this is not true of Sarcosfera coronaria. There will be more arsenic in the mushroom than in the soil. So it's a hyperaccumulator. Now, Calliscypha fulgens is a snowbank mushroom. It's a conifer seed parasite, very widespread. It tends to be blue-green on the outside. And if you happen to find an albino form and the mushroom is pure white, the outside is a beautiful robin's egg blue. Calliscypha fulgens is poisonous, cooked or raw. Alluria, oh, I've got a spelling area. There should not be an O in Alluria. Alluria rantia is not a good edible, but it's edible. Uh, some people sometimes put it a little bit raw in salads as a, as a color additive. I don't recommend eating either one. Now, rushulas. The interesting thing about a Rushula cap color is highly variable. It, it, the cap color is unreliable, but the spore print color is very, very reliable. And you tell a Rushula because it breaks crisply like a piece of chalk. And we're interested in mushrooms that break crisply like a piece of chalk. And then I take a nibble out of the stem and see if it's mild. If the stem is mild, then I take a little and I spit it out. I take a little nibble out of the cap. And if it's also mild, I have an edible rushla. If the stem is peppery, I don't taste the cap because it can be way more peppery than the stem. And many of the peppery rushlas will cause significant gastrointestinal upset. And I also don't eat any of the compacte group of rushlas. These are ones with very dense fat flesh. Those of you that know the Rushula brevipes group, that's what I'm talking about. The black bruising ones in particular should be avoided. The true Rushula brevipes complex, if they're not peppery, some are mild and some are peppery, uh, the mild ones are all edible. And some people like them for the texture. Some people even prefer them to chanterelles. I don't like the texture. It tastes kind of grainy to me. So here's what you don't want to eat. This is a a rushula in the compacti group, very, very dense flesh, very, very firm. It's even hard to break the stem. But when you bruise it, the stem bruises black directly. So it's Albo nigra. Some of them bruise brown, some of them bruise gray, some of them bruise red, red and some of them, but all of those that start out a lighter color like red, brown, or gray turn black in age. And some of the, year, uh, the Asian uh, black bruising mushrooms are deadly poisonous, so I don't eat any black bruising rushlet or brown or red uh, bruising rushlet. Uh, stay away from those. And Lactarius, if we looked at a photograph of Lactarius olympianus from the top, it would look very much like members of the Lactarius deliciosus complex, um, and don't eat it. And again, oh, I've got a double A in Lactarius. I'm sorry, in, in the top. There's about five or six species in the deliciosus complex. None of them are delicious. Rubri lacteus uh, has a reddish milk. The deliciosus complex has an orangey milk. Uh, and Olympianus has a white milk. But from the top, they all look the same, but the underside looks very different. Uh, and um, so if, but if you nibble the stem of Olympianus, it'll be hot, deliciosus and rubri lacteus, and it should be, or I lacteus are both um, mild tasting, but not particularly great edibles. 
And here's Lactarius L. Nicola and Representaneus. These are both hot, don't eat either one. Representaneus is interesting in the white milk uh, stains the gills uh, violet. And then there's the, the uh, hypomyces species that attack. If they attack a brevipes group, it turns a good, uh, uh, into a good edible mushroom known as a lobster. If you're in the East Coast, uh, you, you have a lactarius indigo, it's a good edible. But hypomyces chrysospermus, the bull eater, just turns it into fetid mush. It's not edible. So a fair edible, a fair edible, a mess. Don't eat any red poured mushrooms. I tend to avoid the blue uh, bruising mushrooms because many of them are, are bitter. Uh, don't eat any lexinums. Lexinums are popular. They must be thoroughly cooked if you eat them. But many people, even who've eaten in lexinums for years, will develop a sensitivity and they'll suffer flu-like symptoms. So I've quit eating all lexinums. But what I do eat is members of the Boletus edulis group. In the Rockies, there's a red cap version known as Boletus ruberceps and also a white cap version, Boletus ferrosii. What we're looking for is a netting on the stem, white sponge when it's young and really prime eating. This sponge will turn olive in age. And finally, if you see a whole bunch of spines growing on the edge of a, of a tree, if it's on a conifer, it's Hericium abiatus with little spines. If it's on a hard, hardwood, it's probably Hericium americanum. And if it's on a hardwood and the spines are long and the mushroom itself is big, meaty, you can slice it like meat. The one in this photograph weighed about five pounds. Uh, it, 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 and it tasted like lobster when I cooked it. Both, um, the Boletus edulis and Hericium abetus and Hericium arenaceus are incredibly important, incredibly good uh, medicinal mushrooms. Hericium abetus and arenaceus, especially the mycelium, has the ability to regenerate neurons. So I take a daily uh, small amount of both uh, Hericium arenaceus mycelium, uh, the powder uh, that's commercially available. And then I buy some um, dried Hericium arenaceus, not from Asia, but North American grown stuff, grind that up. And I take some of that along with a little bit of psilocybe every day to hopefully defray uh, increasing um, mental, loss of mental capacity as I grow older. So I hope you've enjoyed this program and that's it.